Today's subject will be the American Revolution and intelligence. And we're joined by an exceptional author who I will introduce momentarily. Um, but before that, I should say a couple words about the revolution itself and history about intelligence. This is one subject um, that is vastly underrepresented in historical literature, the impact of intelligence on the revolution. Most of us, when we went through school, learned about the revolution, even in college level, don't delve into the importance of intelligence operations on the American Revolution. And that's, that's quite problematic, because if you look at the strategic imbalance of the revolution, the advantages that the British had over the Americans, by ignoring the intelligence aspect, you, have, you, get, you don't get the story about how the United States wins the war. The British had almost every advantage. They had a modern professional army that had been battle tested, whereas the colonists did not. They had a small continental army reinforced by militias that could not really be counted on when the battle began. The British had the greatest navy in the world. The Americans didn't have a navy to speak of. We had privateers, we had pirates essentially, that we gave uh, the ability to steal and pillage for their pay. Most of the Americans didn't actually support independence. Less than half of continental Americans supported independence. Thousands fought for the British. And many of the others just wanted to be left alone. That's not to mention the thousands of German soldiers and the thousands of Native Americans that sided with the British cause. Not to mention the fact that the British had the world's greatest economy. And the United States didn't really have one at the time. We had no central bank, and we had a very hard time raising money. So how do we win? Well, it's not just that we wanted it more than they did. It had a lot to do with the fact that we used intelligence better than the British did that George Washington, among others, was really good at utilizing the information that came in from a network of spies and a network of intelligence apparatus that he had set up during this time. And that's what our guest is gonna talk about today. Ken Daigler holds a BA in history from the Center College of Kentucky and a master's in history from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. After he got his master's, he served the United States Marine Corps in the late 1960s and then quickly thereafter, joined the CIA, and Mr. Daigler was a CIA operations officer in the East Asia Division of the National Clandestine Service from 1969 all the way to 2003 when he finally retired. Now, he's written other things. Under the pen name P.K. Rose, Mr. Daigler authored The Founding Fathers of American Intelligence and Black Dispatches, both written for the CIA, but both are available to the public on the CIA's website, so I advise you to go check those out. They're very fascinating. And he's also written numerous articles for intelligence community publications uh, in, the tr in his true name, as well as the P.K. Rose pseudonym, regarding American intelligence activities from 1765 all the way through the end of the Civil War, including articles about intelligence for the CIA's studies of intelligence and um, the Association of Former Intelligence Officers Journal, The Intelligencer. He is here to talk about his newest book, Spies, Patriots, and Traitors. American intelligence during the, in the Revolutionary War. And I'd like to introduce him now, wherever he may be. He was, there he is, all right. Uh, please join me in the International Spy Museum in welcoming, welcoming Ken Daigler. Thank you. Okay, uh, I wanna start by telling you that uh, when you write a book, First thing you're supposed to do is have a business plan and then bother writing a book. Now, I did it kind of backwards. I just wrote the book and assumed somebody would actually read it. Uh, here's the point I want to make. This is the cover of the book. It's a very distinctive cover, not my choice. It was the publisher's choice, and they were obviously absolutely correct about it. But my point is that I've just come back from the beach, as my tan indicates, and I thought, OK, I'm going to walk around the beach down at Rehoboth maybe a little bit over at Dewey, and I'm gonna take a look and see what teenagers are reading my book. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I found not one single male or female teenager reading my book, so obviously that's not the target audience. The target audience instead really consists of people who are interested in the Revolutionary War because, as the introductor said, this is a brand new way of looking at the war to see where intelligence activities have impacted on events that we all accept often through popular myth as the way the, the revolution went on. Now, the second audience are my fellow colleagues in the intelligence profession. Because here, 
have a very interesting opportunity to learn from history. As we get into the Revolutionary War, you find that all three of the key elements in the intelligence profession, positive intelligence, counterintelligence, and covert action, played a key role in the Americans' ability to win. And because I'm dealing with something that's 250 years old, I have the latitude here of naming names, naming identities, naming sources of information, showing what the intelligence reports looked like, showing what the impact they had, and talking about sources and methods. Something I can't do, obviously, in my own background. Why this is fascinating is because over history, intelligence methods don't change. The fact that the Culper Ring left their parchment reports in a leather pouch under a rock in a Long Island cow pasture and the fact that today someone will leave an encrypted note on an obscure website, it's actually the same technology in terms of communication and separation of the individual reporting and the individual who is going to receive the information and use it. So there's a real learning experience here, I believe, in studying the revolutionary activity strictly from the point of view of being an intelligence officer. Now, before I get into the book, I've been told by much more experienced officers that the first thing you're always asked is why did you write the book? Okay, I'll tell you exactly why I started writing the book. I had retired from the agency and spent a little bit of time consulting with Department of Defense. And after about four or five years, you've really done all you can in terms of transferring what experience and capability you have to another organization. So I decided I'd retire again, and this time I'd actually retire and take up a lot of my own personal interests and hobbies and what have you. And that worked for about two, two and a half weeks. It all came to a conclusion when one Saturday my wife, who was quite a good potter, had gone to her studio to work, and I decided I was going to fix myself a lunch that was going to be a bit more than a ham sandwich. But you know, I found the kitchen was very disorganized. I could not find what I wanted in terms of the ingredients. I couldn't find the plates and the glasses I wanted. So I had some spare time, so I reorganized the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out too well. Shortly thereafter, I went to work actually writing a book. <laughs> but the genesis of the book actually comes from over 20 years ago. In the mid-1990s, I was in a management position at the agency and you've got to take this time frame into consideration now. This is the mid-90s. The Cold War is over with. We've defeated the Soviet Empire. But the issue here is that now, like we always do, because we've won, we're going to downsize because we don't have any other enemies out there. Everything's going to be peaceful and wonderful. So the orders came down from above, from the senior management. Budget's going to be cut. We're going to have to do more with less. That phrase normally strikes heart, I mean, strikes fear in the heart of any government employee. But the way we decided to do it at the agency was to increase our efforts with liaison, those friendly security and intelligence services throughout the world that we deal with. Okay, first step was head to enlarge our facilities so we could hold more meetings with them. So for reasons that are esoteric to the job I was in, I had to create some new spaces for the liaison folks. Luckily, I had technical architects and interior designers and others who could actually handle the hard lifting, and all I had to do was conceptualize a little bit. But I found out as I went around talking to various and sundry divisions that handle the actual liaison, that one of the main issues was, while the liaison services understood that we had money compared to them to spend, we were very good technically, but you know, we hadn't been in the business that long, only since World War II, and maybe we didn't quite understand how to handle the more sophisticated aspects of human intelligence. But we had to address this problem. So I did a little bit of research, and I ended up writing the pamphlet that you had mentioned, The Founding Fathers of, of American Intelligence, where we identified George Washington as the key figure in a collection of positive or foreign intelligence, Benjamin Franklin as the key figure in terms of covert action, particularly propaganda, and John Jay, surprisingly enough, as the key figure in terms of counterintelligence. The 
wrote the pamphlet, it was kind of well received. We put out printed copies in the liaison rooms and we named each room after one of these principal figures. Uh, over the years, it's become institutionalized and as was mentioned, it is now on the website and is actually a very popular download on the website and somewhat to my surprise, actually quoted in some history books on the revolution. So that, that basically is the way this all came about. Now, as I said before, the key point behind this book is to look at the revolution from an intelligence point of view. I'm not a historian, I wouldn't claim to be, but I have got about 40 years in intelligence so I can claim a little bit of expertise or at least knowledge in that area. So the key here is that as we go through the revolution starting in 1765, right through the evacuation of New York in 1783, the book chronicles who was involved in intelligence, the impact it had, the mistakes that were made, and how it was done. When we first start, let me, well, rather than review the book for you, I think probably the best approach is to take a couple key issues that probably everybody in this room knows about from your basic history on the American Revolution. And I guess we've got to start with the one principle that always comes to mind when you talk about the Revolution, and that, of course, is George Washington. George Washington was, as chief of the Continental Army, the key consumer for all intelligence during the Revolution. His small battle staff was his analytical arm, but in addition to that, he also functioned very much because of economies of scale, his relationship to the small number of troops he actually had. He also functioned as one of the key intel managers who would actually write specific orders on tradecraft to various and sundry spy rings. Very unusual. You've got the chief consumer, you've got in effect the chief operations officer. And even though it was a rather small element then, the tensions that exist today were the same tensions that existed there. The consumer wants the information right away. The operator wants to get it as quick as possible but protect the sources so that they have the capability to get the information once again. And you see that when you look at what Washington did. Washington ran an incredibly sophisticated operation when you consider who he was and all the other issues he had to deal with in terms of logistics, military strategy, leadership, and the politics at the time. Washington was an expert at what I would say is probably the most difficult aspect of intelligence, deception planning. Deception planning allowed him on many occasions, all strategic, to completely fool the British commanders as to the size of his army and what he planned to do with it. Yet for deception operations, you need three key factors that are very hard to put together. Number one, you've got to be able to control the information that is coming out from your side so that there is a steady stream only of what you want done. That means no leaking. It also means often falsifying internal reporting to junior officers so that they can't inadvertently say what's going on. Number two, you've got to have sources, double agents primarily, or people who are friendly with the adversary to whom you can purposefully leak information so that you know the information is going to the adversary's command. And thirdly, and this is really a key that most people forget, you've got to have the sources within the enemy command to know that your message is not only getting there, but also that it's coming back and you can reverberate it back in a way that makes the enemy truly believe they're making the decision and providing a validation for that information. Pretty darn sophisticated for a guy who was busy with a lot of other stuff. So how did he get to learn this? It's obviously, it's not something you just learn by uh, thinking about it. Well, if you go back to his early diaries, as early as 1753, you find that the first time he was sent to the Ohio country by the royal governor of Virginia to see what the French were doing, he immediately started to hone his skills, not only in elicitation and debriefing, but also in observation. One key point he, he makes in his journal from my, the fall of 53 is very fascinating. He was kept at a certain French fort until a commanding officer from the French forces would come and see him. And obviously they knew he was reporting. He was able to observe and have a good memory, so he wouldn't have to write it down, of what the fort looked like 
the number of French soldiers, number of cannon, etc., but he could have no feel for those French forces that were outside the fort or the Indian allies they had. So what did he do in his spare time? Since it was a lot of exercise, he walked up and down the riverbank and counted all the canoes and extrapolated from there exactly what type of a force could be moved at any given time. You get to 1754, when he goes back out and actually involves himself in fighting with the French, and you find that he's able to use deserters, not only in terms of very sophisticated debriefings, but also in terms of spreading disinformation and using them as propaganda value to encourage more desertions from the enemy. And by the time you get to 1755, when he's an unofficial aide to General Braddock, you find that he's also learning a great deal about the operational security aspects of military movements, of putting out your advanced troops, but also the mistake Braddock made, which was he did not have any intelligence forward of his main, main attacking force. So 20 years before, in August of 1775, he takes over the army, he's already starting to develop the intelligence experience. So it, it's not unusual that with someone like him, it, it has worked to his advantage. Now, one of the things you need if you're going to start a revolution is you need political organization. And in 1765, with the Stamp Act, you started immediately to have small groups in all of the coastal cities and some of the inland cities who decided that they were going to organize politically against the Stamp Act and that type of taxation. In the course of 10 years, a group calling themselves the Sons of Liberty evolved into a, as sophisticated a united front organization as anything we've ever seen that we normally associate with Communist Party type of organizations, either the Soviet Union or the Chinese. What is fascinating about this is that in most American history texts, you look at the Sons of the Revolution and you see a caricature. You see a caricature of drunken people, maybe tarring, feathering some government administrator or riding them around on a log or dancing drunkenly around a, a liberty pole with a cap on top of it. Well, let me tell you, there was a lot more sophisticated than that. Starting in the mid-1760s, gentleman Sam Adams, who gets a lot less credit for this than he deserves, started to organize the various groups of individuals calling themselves Sons of Liberty all along the coast, all the way from Massachusetts down to Charleston. By the time you get to the mid-1770s, this is an organization that has put its people in all the key political leadership, the provincial conference, uh, uh, congresses, the committees of safety, the militia units, and what have you. So you've got a united front organization that started out with a very broad idea that they were going to oppose taxation. And by the mid-70s, you've got an organization that has decided they want political independence. You've got an organization that can not only put people in the street often mobs, often much more sophisticated type of groups that can send a message. You've got a propaganda element where the majority of the printers, who in those days were actually the newspaper publishers, are members of the Sons of Liberty, and have established a courier route so that within weeks, the same perspective on a political event or an opposition approach to the administration of, of the BRICS can come all the way from Massachusetts down through the southern colonies with exactly the same message, a very strong political force. In addition, you've got a paramilitary force. By the time you get to about 1773, the British recognize that where they don't physically have military, they have virtually no control. And these paramilitary forces, these militia forces that have been regroomed and politically led primarily by Sons of Liberty are at this point making sure that they take over the powder, they take over the arms from the various uh, ministerial armaments in the, in the colonies. By the time you get to 73 and 74, you've actually got these forces forming up, not engaging, but forming up to stop British forces from coming back to try and get these arms or to try to reoccupy a fort. And by the time you get to 1775, of course, you, you have Concord and, and uh, Lexington. And what is fascinating about this 
is that the very final evolution of the United Front Group from an intelligence point of view is it becomes an intelligence organization. And that's exactly what happened. First with the committees of safety, who were able to monitor exactly what the British were doing at their major installations and, and locations. For example, thanks to the Committee of Safety in Boston, the militia and the Sons of Liberty knew exactly what route the British were going to take to get to Concord because two months earlier, they had monitored the two officers that General Gage had sent out to actually go down there. So all they had to find out then was the timing, and they were able to do that through a second organization they set up, which in theory is the founding of the first American intelligence organization called the Mechanics, a group led operationally by Paul Revere, but more leadership-wise by two other members, Dr. Joseph Warren and Dr. Benjamin Church. This organization actually was offensive and had penetrations of General Gage's command. So that by the time they got to Lexington and Concord, they not only knew what place was going to be attacked, when the movement started, but the exact route that was going to be taken down there and obviously back, which if you think about it, puts an entirely different light on why the British took so many casualties and why these diverse militia groups from all over central Massachusetts were able to hone in as well as they were on the march going back. It's because they had advanced knowledge of it. Uh, I always say, if you want to connect something to modern affairs, let's look at what another former intelligence officer, Vladimir uh, Putin, did recently in Crimea. If you want to look and see how he was able to very effectively shut off the greater government of Ukraine from Crimea, all you got to do is look at the way the Sons of Liberty did it, because it's exactly the same structure that he worked over a period of time. And you'll find many other examples of that in the book that if you extrapolate, you see it's still going on today. Now, I think the second thing I'd like to talk about is a covert action campaign that we really don't give enough credit to. After the conflict actually started, the uh, colonial forces actually found that they had very little in the way of logistics necessary to carry on a war. In the colonies, there was virtually no capability to create gunpowder. Very little capability to create firearms, very little capability to create cannon or any type of heavy artillery. They found they needed that. How do you handle something like that if you're a revolutionary organization? You create a covert action campaign, which is what was done with the assistance of France. Like all good covert action campaigns, this started on a dark and stormy night in December in 1775 at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia, when Benjamin Franklin, the head of a newly created Continental Congress committee called the Committee of Secret Correspondence, met with an individual traveling as a Flemish merchant, who in reality was a secret agent from the King of France. Now I'm talking December 1775. During the course of three nights, they discussed what help France would provide, and the Americans, Franklin, promised two things. He promised, number one, we will declare political independence from Great Britain. Number two, he promised we'll defeat the British Army. A little hesitant in the second one, but nevertheless, that's what he did promise. What was the result? The result was the creation of a company that was phenomenal called Hortelez and Company led by an individual named Pierre Beaumarchais. For those of you who are literary oriented, you might know Beaumarchais because he wrote the marriage of, uh, the barbarous civilian marriage of Figaro, which became quite well known as operas. But he actually was an, another secret agent operating for the King of France. Under him, he created a company that by 1778 had over 100 sailing ships that delivered hundreds of tons of gunpowder, stacks of weapons, cannons, other military supplies for two years that allowed the Continental Army to exist. Without these military supplies, it is really doubtful that Washington would have been able to fight as long as he had. At Bunker Hill, for example, 
before the ships started rolling in, they had two shocks per person. By the time you get to December of 1776, a very crucial time, they're down to about three shocks per person, but a much smaller army, probably effective of 3,000 people. A very important asset here. The three people connected with that, interestingly enough, were, of course, Benjamin Franklin, who at that point became the uh, diplomatic head of the Paris Commission, the U.S.'s first diplomatic session abroad over in Paris, and, of course, Beaumarchais, operating behind the scenes under an alias running his company, and then thirdly, a gentleman named Robert Morris in Philadelphia, who was the financier of the revolution. It was his job to get the colonies to produce the agricultural products that could be sent back to Europe to repay the various loans. Now, there is a very famous cartoon, political cartoon, and I think it was from the Chicago Tribune, but I'm not absolutely sure. It might have been from a New York paper. It had to do with World War I when blackjack Pershings made the famous line, Lafayette, we are here, meaning we're returning the favor of what you helped us with during the American Revolution. And it, the, it's a beautiful drawing. It has the American doughboys in their tin hacks and with their M1 rifles and their long bayonets landing on the coast of France. And then up on the cliffs is a ghostly figure of Lafayette. And the voice coming out of the American troops is, Lafayette, we are here. A French historian told me that what Lafayette should have responded was, yes, but did you bring your checkbooks? The reason for that is we never paid back any of the loan that the British, I mean, that the French gave us in, our, in assistance against the British. We're talking millions of dollars, which in those days was big money. Never paid it back. Interesting point to keep in mind when we get so concerned that other countries don't pay us back on the aid we gave them. Um, let me tell you about probably what I think is the key point in the war where intelligence played such an important role. There's a couple points here, and if I have time, I'll try to go into another one, but it was December of 1776. Washington had just been swept out of New York. He was pushed across New Jersey. It's snowing. He's down to about maybe an army of 5,000 people, effective maybe 3,000. They've got no ammunition. These guys are marching literally barefoot through the snow. The enlistments are about to go up in January. This is the low point. Washington actually is thinking at this point that if I can't do something, I'm going to take what troops I've got and I'm going west of the Alleghenies and I'm going to conduct a protracted war from back there. I, God knows how that would have worked out. But then it turns all around, because we all know what happened. We all know he decides to move across to Delaware and to attract, attack Trenton and subsequently attack Princeton. Two major victories, which turns the whole morale of the army around, causes the colonies to resupply him with troops, causes some of his seasoned troops to actually sign on, and you start to see a few supplies coming. It allows him to have a safe winter. Why did that all happen? Well, it all happened because of intelligence. It happened because he knew exactly the order of battle, who was sitting in Princeton. He knew it was Colonel Rowell's Hessian regiment, who had fought all the way from Long Island through Manhattan and through New Jersey. He knew they were a battle-tested group. These were tough guys. But he also knew that they had been in constant combat now for about five months. He knew that the New Jersey militia had basically had them surrounded at Trenton, had been constantly picking away at them, had hindered any of their efforts to go out and get logistics such as firewood or local agricultural products, had constantly attacked their outposts, had kept them on guard for all the time since they established their, their position at Princeton. He also knew, in my belief, a lot about Colonel Rowell primarily from an individual named John Honeyman. And there is some debate about whether John Honeyman's story is true. I happen to believe it is, and I explain that. Honeyman knew Rowell and was a spy for Washington and was able to tell Washington that Rowell was a strong Prussian character who had no respect for the American soldier whatsoever, to the point that he refused to build fortifications around Trenton. 
His famous quote is, if the Americans are foolish enough to attack, we will repel them with our bayonets. He also drank a little bit, which might have been one of the reasons that Washington chose the particular time to attack that he did. Not that the Hessian troops were drunk, because they weren't, although sometimes you'll hear that they were. So Washington was able to have a great victory at a really crucial time because he truly understand the, understood the enemy and understood the weakness of the enemy. Same thing actually is true with Princeton as well. Thanks to some crucial debriefing of deserters and his knowledge of the troops who were at Princeton and the fact that a spy only referred to in official correspondence as a young gentleman was able to tell him the defensive positions around Princeton and the one unguarded area that the British had not put up a defense in. Okay, so Washington was unable to take Princeton. Another victory, another bit of morale, a few more troops, some more enlistments. At a very crucial time in our history. And then he ends it all up with an excellent deception plan that causes the British to believe that his army is about four times bigger than it is. And this is a classic deception plan. Among other things, writing up false estimates of troop strength, leaving them in places where merchants who have Tory connections are traveling through, and just happen to see them on a person's desk when that person is called out of the room. Or taking the same troops, and as the British prisoners are being exchanged, having them take a route right past a troop concentration where troops with different flags are marched in circular to indicate that he has more than he has. Or lighting up certain buildings to indicate occupancy that isn't there. All of which saves him in the crucial, dec the crucial war period from December of 76 until well into the spring of 77. Finally, let me say something about Yorktown. I think we're all aware of Yorktown and how important that was. What we seldom dwell on is that Yorktown was made possible because of a strong deception plan that Washington used for some nine months against the British commander General Clinton in New York, making him believe that as the French forces and the American forces were meeting above New York, that their intent was to attack New York City, which kept Clinton from reinforcing Cornwallis down in the Tidewater area. And the book goes into some detail as to exactly sources he used, some of whom were some of his most valuable intelligence sources because they were individuals who the British had recruited for three and four years and actually used as couriers to carry their command instructions up to Canada and down to the south. So he was willing to use some of his best collection capabilities at this point for the deception operation. And it was obviously extremely effective. But we never hear much about that. What we hear about is how Cornwallis was defeated. And it was due primarily to the deception plan that kept Clinton believing that New York was the target until all of the American and most of the French forces had actually moved south of the city. And at that point, it was too late because the French fleet had effectively blocked off the tidewater. Now, I gotta also say a couple words about the two people that we always associate with spying in a Revolutionary War. I mean, if you know anything about the Revolutionary War, if you read any, any book on it, whether it's a biography or an actual book on the war, if you look under spies, you're probably gonna <coughs> find two names. You're gonna find Nathan Hale, you're gonna find Benedict Arnold. But the truth of the matter is, most of what we know about Nathan Hale is frankly a myth created primarily in the early 19th century. From an intelligence point of view, the one thing to know about Nathan Hale is if you want to run a good intelligence operation, from selecting an agent, to having an objective, to how you train, to how you do communication, you just do everything opposite than what was done with Nathan Hale. He was a very brave man, deserves a lot of respect for being willing to die for his country, but he was an incredibly poor choice for his job. I'll give you one prime example. This was a man who did not believe in telling a lie. Let me tell you, you don't want an intelligence agent behind enemy lines who is not willing to tell a lie because it doesn't work out very well. 
and also with all his faults and how badly the operation was structured, and I frankly blame Washington for this in the book because he had the ultimate responsibility. It turned out that the reason he was caught was not inherently because of the mistakes that were made. It's because the British had a better counterintelligence officer working against him, an individual named Robert Rogers, who some of you might remember as the head of Rogers Rangers in the French and Indian War. Second one, Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold is a very interesting figure because there are still people today who say, well, he was a hero at a certain given point and we've got to give him some latitude. He was really harassed by the Continental Congress. The politics of this were really bad. He paid out of his own pocket and wasn't reimbursed, et cetera. And, and some of this is true, although that happened to many other people and they did not become traitors. But when you analyze this strictly from an intelligence point of view, as I did in the book, you find that as opposed to this being a huge blow to the American cause, in reality, it was probably one of the two biggest blunders that British intelligence made because they handled him so badly. His volunteering effort was, was almost put aside for other things. He was not vetted before, all because the officer handling it, young Major Andre, was a staff officer much more attuned to handling the social responsibilities of being an aide to a commanding general than the intelligence aspects of it. Had Benedict Arnold been properly handled, been kept in place, the damage he could have done to the revolution at that point may not have changed the course of the war, but would definitely have changed the course of the negotiation that led to the peace. So, I honestly believe that just as you can look at the revolution from a political point of view, or a leadership point of view, or an economic point of view, I've actually read books that have looked at it from a Marxist point of view, that adding the intelligence overlay allows the individual to take a much better look at why things happened the way they did. Another aspect that, frankly, I think has been to a large degree ignored, except perhaps in four or five books since the 1940s. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, now we will have the opportunity to ask questions um, after the question and answer period. Uh, you'll be in the back signing books if you're interested. We certainly have a pretty significant supply of these books because they're selling well, so we keep ordering them. Uh, and you, you know, you'll be signing them later on. But first, uh, open it up for any questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, wait for the microphone, please, since uh, it's the way we'll pick it up on the camera. Well, my question is actually not directly related to the book itself. But I'm just curious, as most people are, I'm sure, touring the museum. We know most CIA agents are spies who are clandestine. But then every now and then, you hear people say, oh, I retired from the CIA. I, so are they supposed to know that they worked with the CIA? Or, or not everybody's a spy in the CIA, you know? So, so I don't know what the difference is. Are we supposed to know or not? Uh, when you're on active duty, if you're an operations officer, your connection with the agency is not made public in most cases. But also, there's, there's, it's misconstrued. A spy is someone who has access to information of value. A CIA officer seldom has that. Normally, a CIA officer's job is to recruit and effectively manage and collect reporting from what you would call a spy, someone who actually has the access. So when the CIA person refers to himself as a spy or herself as a spy, you got to kind of wonder what they're thinking I did. I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, that would be a whole course in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I just wonder, when we went to World War II and we um, helped the French against the uh, Nazi Germany, do you think that um, we felt indebted to um, the French on some level because of their help to us over the Revolutionary War? I think we them? probably repaid that debt after World War I with the horrible bloodshed and the amount of money that we poured into it. I think at the point of World War II, it was simply the need for a, a strong allied presence to overcome a, a, a vastly superior German army at the time. Thank you, Ken, very much. Uh, you made only brief mention, and of course, this is a brief talk of 
Robert Culper, Jr. Uh, Samuel Culper, Jr., true name Robert Townsend. And I've long wondered why at CIA there's a statue of Nathan Hale who failed and not one of Robert Townsend who was a great success. He also mentioned Andre uh, who um, was a fascinating man, I believe. I've written about him. And on his tomb at Westminster Abbey, uh, not Westminster Abbey, yeah, at Westminster Abbey, um, the king had, him, uh, had a brilliant and lengthy, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, hmm? Epitaph? Yeah, epitaph. Thank you. Epitaph, which includes the phrase that he showed too much zeal, <laughs> which, of course, is what killed him mm -hmm. and what destroyed their chance to have Arnold as a, no, a long-term asset. Exactly, Burton. Uh, I agree with you. I often wonder why we had Nathan Hale there. Uh, there is a statue outside of the auditorium between the main building and the auditorium at CIA headquarters of Nathan Hale. It's the type of statue that you see probably in 150, 175 places around the U.S. Very heroic pose of an individual. Truth of the matter is, we have no idea what Nathan Hale looked like. It's yet another part of the, the entire myth. But he was, but I mean, he deserves credit because he was more than willing to die for his country while others weren't. Uh, the Culpers, of course, have got a renewed interest now because of the AMC series Turn and a book that is a historical fiction book called The Secret Six that uh, is able to play out characterizations a little bit better because they are able to use this, a, a fictional approach to it. The issue of spying on uh, allied powers has currently surfaced. I'm wondering, during the revolution, were there espionage operations against our French allies? By the British in Paris, the British did an excellent job of penetrating the French government and also penetrating extremely well our diplomatic and thing. American spying on the French. No, we were too busy basically hanging on. There was, however, one proven, well, in Paris, the French government obviously watched the three commissioners, the American commissioners, very carefully, and there was reporting on that. But in the army itself, one of the foreign contractors that's an interesting point. Under Hortelez and company, they started a tradition that today people seem to think just started during the, one of the Gulf Wars, which was the hiring of contractors to serve in the U.S. Army. The Continental Congress hired a lot of foreign military officers in specialized fields like engineering and artillery because the expertise didn't exist in America. One of those officers, DeKalb, actually was a, a French spy who, while he died gallantly leading Maryland troops, but he reported back privately his view of how the war was going to the French government, something that, say, a military attaché would do today who was attached to a foreign government. Uh, in my previous experience, the national interests of various countries are always different. So consequently, it is always good for policymakers to know what somebody else's agenda is. My understanding is that um, spying was not a, uh, a very gentlemanly thing to do in the uh, 18th century. And what's interesting about Nathan Hale is he was a gentleman. And I, I believe that his friends tried to talk him out of taking on this mission because it wasn't a very gentlemanly thing to, to, be, to be a spy. And I wondered if you might talk about that a little bit and if George Washington had any, any feelings about that. He did, that's a very good point. The first individual selected by Colonel Knowlton, and Colonel Knowlton's Rangers, which the Army claims to be the first military intelligence group, which is the reason that their insignia has 1775 on it. That was the group that Washington asked to select someone to go behind the enemy lines in New York. The first individual that Knowlton wanted to do this job refused for exactly the reason you said. He said, no, I'm a gentleman. And you're right, many of uh, Hale's friends did try to talk him out of accepting it because it was not considered gentlemanly. 
The comment in Washington is very interesting. It goes back to what Burton was saying about the Culper Ring. Uh, while the war was going on, Washington was fairly generous with his money and even more generous with his, his advice on how this very complex espionage ring in New York was supposed to be run, known as the Culper Ring. But right after the war was over with, and I, make, I, I note in my book the absolute truth that after the war, the infantryman and the intelligence agent is re really considered in a much less friendly light than they are during the war. He, he writes very tellingly, now I am not sure that all the money I spent on the Culper Ring was worthwhile. Well, the truth of the matter, it was. But for exactly that reason, because Washington also was a gentleman, and I'm not suggesting that, that Townsend wasn't or anything like that, but you're right, that, that concept of it's beneath me to spy. It, I, I, I think, frankly, today it's still true. Now, this is directed toward the French. In the world wars, do you think if we would and have cried out for French to help us, do you think the wars would have gone um, quicker and more swiftly? The French government was in a position where they were not adequately prepared to actually declare war on the British until after the Battle of Saratoga, where the American forces proved that they were strong enough to defeat an, an army in the field. And it was really touch and go. I mean, we came so close in December of 1776 to totally dissipating as an army that it is remarkable. Uh, the fascinating aspect of Saratoga is that historians estimate that 80 plus percent of the gunpowder used by the American troops during the two battles that comprised the Saratoga campaign came from Hortez Hortelez and Company. Without them, there could have been no, no win. But that was that allowed Benjamin Franklin to use some propaganda and some other aspects. And at that point, the, British, the French crown had actually turned over its armament by selling off its old armament to Hortelez for shipment to the US to the point that it was able to take on Great Britain along with Spain. So I'd like to ask a methodological question, if I could jump in. Uh, you, had, you had talked about the fact that since it's so long ago, you have the luxury of talking about sources and methods, and you can use real names. On the other hand, being so long ago, documentary evidence is problematic, and certainly when you're talking about intelligence and how close to the vest that Washington kept a lot of these spy rings. Um, a lot of what I've heard about intelligence from this comes even after the war when Washington is billing the Continental Congress for the amount of money out of pocket. How difficult was it to come up with the actual evidence for writing this book uh, and the, the, you know, something new because uh, just the time in between makes right. documents very difficult to come up with. The primary documents are often difficult, not just because they're so old, but if you've ever tried to read the spelling from somebody who wrote in the 18th century, God help you, you really need glasses. But uh, Washington was very good about protecting sources and methods. However, occasionally he would slip. In the case of the Culper Ring, a lot of subsequent documents were found in the papers of, of certain individuals involved, some of his staff people. But he, also in the pension records, because by the 1830s, you found extensive pension records explaining what they did during the war and then justifications that involved officers' affirmations of their actions that allows you to look at it. There's one individual just because this, this speaks to your point, named David McLean, a fine Kent, Delaware guy, who was one of Washington's very good intelligence officers on several occasions. Not only around Philadelphia, but he also went into Stony Point and did a personal reconnaissance that allowed Wayne to eventually do a bayonet charge and take that place. He also was at Paulus Hook and some other places. But his documents are really fascinating because this was a very disorganized guy. This was a guy who, when he had a thought, would take whatever piece of paper he had on it and would simply write down what he thought. So you have a bill for a horse dated one, one time, and on the back you have something written such as, Arnold is involved with the British, which he did write. But you'd have no idea when he wrote that. 
whether he wrote it before or after the fact because he had written it in the back of a piece of paper. It was a real challenge. In the case of General Green, where I have done original research, I simply went through his 26 volumes of correspondence and then went back and went over to Society of Cincinnati and looked at some of their correspondence. That's why it took 20 years, I think. Right, right. <laughs> Were the British, sp the military spies that are, were British, was there any other reason other than greed that they were spying for Americans? Well, we've got to be very careful here about who's a spy for the British, because everybody was British until July. Well, but I mean, seriously, it, it's not fair to call someone who was loyal to the crown a spy. Uh, very few examples of high-level spies within the American structure. Uh, Benjamin Church is the best example, and he was a nasty spy. He did it strictly for money. This is a guy I'd mentioned earlier who was one of the leaders of the mechanics, the first intelligence organization. Well, what I didn't mention was that uh, General Gates actually had the first intelligence organization penetrated because he did have Church reporting on it. But it put him in a very fascinating situation because if he bothered to arrest all of the leaders of the mechanics, then the Committee of Safety and the Sons of Liberty would have just set up another group and he wouldn't know who they were. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a CI problem you, you constantly have. There's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know if you decide to arrest people as opposed to monitor what they're doing. After uh, we were supplied by this French company for two years, did we find a way of making our own guns, or did that company still keep supplying us? Uh, after 1778 and the formal alliance with France, French warships could then escort, transport, bringing military supplies in. Before then, it had to be done covertly, clandestinely through harbor entrances or often through Caribbean islands or things like that. Once the, the weight of the French military could come to play, it was an entirely different deal. But we never got to the point where we could produce gunpowder or arms in any sizable number. And that, that goes through the War of 1812, for that matter. All right, well, please join me again uh, in the International Spy Museum in thanking Ken Degler for taking the time to talk about his book today. Uh, and he will be in the back signing it if you want to ask any further questions or you want to purchase his book and have him sign it for you. Uh, he's available for that. So thank you again. Thank you.